use the panelists first. Right, thanks. Thank you very much, Stephen. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's an absolute honor to actually be here um, as, a, as a facilitator of this very exciting discussion, hopefully, that we will have. Um, not hopefully, definitely. Um, but before I introduce our, um, our panelists, I'd just like us to reflect a little bit on community development and its roots. Community development is often um, perceived or framed as a, a voluntary act. It's people doing voluntary work. And the purpose and the reason for this gathering today is to actually begin to interrogate and go beyond um, the community development as a, as, as a voluntary voluntary work. And the people that will, will, will be speaking to those elements are the experts in their fields. <laughs> and they, will each, they each bring a particular um, view, a particular uh, stance, um, a particular uh, energy to community development in their various different contexts. And I shall introduce you to them. Each of these panelists um, today have worked tirelessly and continue to work tirelessly um, to promote community development as policymakers or being involved in policy, policy work, um, as academics, as practitioners, most important people as, as practitioners. So today we have four panelists. Um, and they will speak to the professionalization of community development from their various perspectives. Um, and before I introduce, um, introduce them individually, I'd like to just give you a little bit of background, but I would like them to come and join me on the stage. So our panelists. Um, so we have um, Nikki, Heinelis. Marcel and Cornell <clears throat> and Cornell. Each of these four individuals on the stage have a long history um, in community development in their various um, capacities. Um, and when we spoke earlier a little bit about, you know, so what's what's motivated you to get involved in community development? Um, you know, and, and it's really interesting that each of them have a unique story. Um, so at the moment, um, I'm going to start with Heinelise, who's right uh, on, on my far left. Um, she's um, currently the CEO of an organization called Sinatemba Swatland. Um, and what inspires her is that she always felt the need to respond to um, elements or issues that, that, that um, communities confronted by. She comes from a, back, a theology background. I'm not going to go into the intricacies how she moved <laughs> from theology to um, community, uh, community development. Um, but the organization she works for um, is, um, focuses on community health. Um, and um, they work in 11 communities in the Swatland area. And they work in partnership with the Department of Health. So when I spoke with all four of these ladies, the, the word partnership popped up time and time again. Um, so they will speak to all of that. Heinelis is also one of our students, one of our honor students um, here at Cornerstone. Um, um, and I'm, I'm very proud of her. <laughs> as the, the, the um, program head for community development sociology. Then Nikki, welcome. Welcome, Hanlis. Welcome, Nikki. Um, is also one of our students. Um, Nikki comes from a, a student activist background. <laughs> um, she's currently doing our highest certificate in community development. Um, and she works as an auxiliary social worker at The Big Issue, um, where she did a little bit of background about um, some of the things she does there, um, where she works with marginalized adults um, and you know, facilitating access to education 
um, training opportunities, um, job opportunities, skills development. So not just the, the individuals, but also their children um, are involved in um, in the whole process. Because I, I think often when we work with adults, we sometimes forget that there are children involved as well. Um, so we are um, very proud of Nikki and the work she does. Um, and we, we're very happy to have her here. And she will speak from her experience as a practitioner as well as a student. And the next person I would like to introduce you is, is Marcel Lont. Marcel Lont, she's sitting next to Nikki, the beautiful lady with the tiger outfit. <laughs> she's, she's a tiger. She's a tiger. Um, she, uh, welcome, Marcel. Um, Marcel is the head of department at um, for, um, uh, Department of Social Work at the University of Western Cape. Her uh, background is in um, uh, a focus is engaging as a strong focus on um, uh, uh, people at risk, young people at risk. You know, she says, "I touch people; other people don't want to touch." <laughs> So, oh. <laughs> welcome, uh, Marcel. So, Marcel will speak from a sort of academic perspective. Um, and then, last but not least, um, uh, Cornell, um, who is, has got a long history in being involved in the process of professionalization of community development. And she will talk to that in particular. Um, she she is very involved in the the policy process. Um, she's also assisted us as 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 an institution to get our our um, qualifications up and running, and we're very grateful for that. Um, and she she has continues to have input and engagements with our students around um, the, the issues around policy and professionalization of of um, um, community development. So these are our panelists. So I'm not going to take up their time. I'm just going to hand over to Cornell, who will kick off um, the conversation um, and, and uh, present to you a professionalization of community development from a policy perspective. Over to you. I think so. We'll uh, stay seated. Uh, it's much easier to, as community development practitioners, I remember one of the first things when I stopped as a practitioner and I ended up at university, I was often asked by my then HOD, Conal, why are you sitting down when you teach students? And it's just because it's so different. The, the, the whole philosophy of community development um, and its principles for equality and empowerment, etc. It starts in sitting down, looking each other in the eye and connecting. And so I'm very glad that tonight we can connect. Um, I have had quite a nice, I would say, this is how we roll, like the students say, but I had a nice role so far with Cornerstone Institute. He's one of the higher education institutions that has from day one been involved in spearheading professionalization. So what is this professionalization of community development? There's a short history in the sense that from 2009, it, the heat was given by practitioners to the then Minister of Social Development and also the Minister of Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs. A little bit at the Department of Trade and Industry, but we found that our public sector practitioners started giving quite a bit of heat through the unions and say, we are not being recognized. Yet, if we look at the statistics, public servants in community development is the smallest percentage of practitioners. The biggest part of practitioners is in the non-governmental organizations, and then a huge part in the voluntary part. And this is why our facilitators indicated the problem has been that people assume if you're in community development practice that you're a volunteer. Yes, it is a huge part of, of voluntary work. And it is even if you're a paid practitioner, we've discussed it earlier, how there isn't really hours, you know, because development is 
with and by the people, and so life happens, and when life happens, it sometimes happens late at night, it happens on Saturdays, it happens on Sundays, it happens. And so we have that part where there's been a drive, and in our South African context, in the apartheid days, community development was driven actually by activists. One of the things we forget about South Africa is that we actually had a ministry for community development <laughs> in the apartheid days. We had a minister for it too. It was for Wurt. And so often when we started this professionalization process, something that came strong from the people was that we will not have a ministry of community development just because of that history. But because of that history and the marginalization and legislation of inequality, we found that activists actually did what community development practitioners do today. So in 2009, we started the process. I'm not sure if it was for my past sins that I got involved in it, but it was, it was a process that was close to my heart. I was back since 2006, back in South Africa after having worked in several of the SADC countries in development with cabinets and parliaments. Now, I think everybody always says, mm, you look just like 2009 when we saw you. And then I said, yes, the professionalization has made me tired at times, but not older. But if you work with governments in development, that makes you old. So if you go and see what I looked like in 2002 to 2006, two different people from a young, happy person to a tired old lady trying to make development work. And so in 2009, South African government said, we want to professionalize. And we need to, and I'm going to use it in the Western Cape, we need to mobilize people. Because I know it's almost a swear word in this province. But the mobilization of people is what makes things change. And so we started broad consultations and said, how do we mobilize? And so in short, at the time, we approached the then Council for Social Work and said we want to professionalize community development practitioners. Also because several community development practitioners were qualified social workers. And so the Council said never. I like never. My mother always says never say never. And so we said, well, we have to continue because two things drove professionalization and still does quality and standardization. And so although it's done by many people out of their own goodwill and good heart, it's too good and good not too good at times because of lack of skills. And so we work with communities and they have no means to ensure quality. So they sometimes fall victim of something that we want to do, not something they would want to do or drive and, and champion, but what we think. So we come as an outsider and say, you know, I think you should. And so the professionalization is a lot about let's standardize. Let's get everybody with the same knowledge, skills, and attributes. And these attributes are very important. Marcel and I often say it's going to be quite challenging to get a code of ethics into an activist. You see, an activist is somebody that works on the edge of a square box. And the minute we don't get our way, we jump outside the box. And that ethical practice is going to be a challenge. But I'm sure she will speak more to that. And so in 2009, we said, right, let's start with qualifications. Let's say, how do we train practitioners? And the then minister said, it must be all inclusive. This process must not leave anybody out. So we don't want an elitist professional body. We often... To be a professional is an elite body. And so in the rest of the world, many countries, Ireland, United Kingdom, they've all tried to professionalize community development, and they failed. Halfway through, they failed because people would say it goes against community development that is equality, empowerment, and because this is elitist. So in South Africa, we say everybody can register. And so if you have no formal qualification, there's even a process of how you can get into that to say, but I can practice at this level, right up to 
if you have a PhD in how you will practice. So as a start, we did four qualifications. One, a national certificate. So that's at what we call a level four. It's for somebody who didn't finish secondary school. Then the level five that runs at two places, an occupational one at a college or a higher certificate like Cornerstone is doing. And so that's for somebody who wants to move in to the practice or for our youth who didn't get metric exemption. And so that level five gets you into what we call the level eight degree. It's a four-year degree. But here comes the other story again where Cornerstone is the champion of it in South Africa is to offer the honors program. The level eight one year, but they run it over two years part-time. Because so many of us, I'm originally qualified as a sociologist. You see, sociologists, we watch people. And we watch them and watch them. And so I got tired of watching them and wanting to do something with them. And that's how I got into community development. And so we will always have practitioners that comes from another qualification. And so this honors program of Cornerstone is to migrate me into community development, whether I came from a theology background, sociology, development studies, whatever my background, I can come through that. So that was in short what was done. And then we developed, and I was here, when was I here, Renee? Last week, no? last of last week, last of last week, with the higher certificate group on the policy for social service practitioners in community development. And so that policy is what gives us the norms and standards. So it tells us what are the norms, in what little box are we operating, and how do we quality assure that. And so these are all draft documents at the moment. Why? Parliament must sign off on it. And Parliament can't sign off on it until the professional board has been elected. So next year, there will be national elections, well, nominations and elections for board members. And then once the board is endorsed, then there will be a board for community development practitioners, just like we have a board for social work, a board for child and youth. And so we will have a board for community development under the now council for social service practitioners. So it's no longer, never. So they were right in a sense. It was never going to happen with the council for social work. But now that there's a council for social service practitioners, there are these boards under that. And so that's in short the journey that we've been in about, in and out, um, and out and about. The last part that I just want to highlight for the group is that this uh, 18th of November, 2021, 22 and 25 November, there will be a Western Cape outreach on community development professionalization. So anybody who wants to know or wants to attend, it will be in different areas. The 18th will be in the central Karoo area. Um, and I think West Coast is on the 25th. The others are Metro, so it's sort of in the area close by. But please feel free to send an email to chairperson at SOGD. It's not because we are sighing about all of this. It stands for South African. Association for Community Development, S-A-A-C-D. So chairperson at sarkt.com and you will be able to get more information. So it's open for anybody who wants to know more. You can also, if you don't want to attend, but just be able to link and get onto the database so that you receive correspondence and that you can be part of the elections and nominations next year, please feel free to send an email. So I'll and therefore, now on the policy side, because you saw the audience when you said, now we'll talk about policy. Because I'm like that. Policy is all the legality. But in this case, it's an exciting policy. And I will hand to Marcel, who will uh, make policy happen for us. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Cornell, for that input. And we will leave questions or comments until the end. So if you have any questions or comments, feel free to jot them down. Um, so um, after all the speakers have done their, their little bit, um, you will then have the opportunity to, to pose questions or make comments based on the, on the, on the, on the presentations. All right, thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. I think 
what you saw now, that's what they do to social workers. They kind of, <laughs> you know, my inclusion in this panel today is such a reflection of the spirit of what this community development practitioners, the whole move is. It's about inclusivity. It's about working across borders. It's about collaborating. And so what I want to do is just look at the issue from an academic point of view. Um, the Department of Social Work is going to house the ComDev undergrad degree in our department as a first step, you know. So I would like to reflect on some of the challenges. And I think the first challenge is most third year degree graduate students take at least eight years to finish that three year degree. And so apart from curriculation and content of curriculum, maybe that's one of the areas that we need to think about. What are we going to do to learn from the models that are available, or learn from the best practice models? So the fact that students who enroll, enroll for three-year degree takes eight years to finish it, it's not only about them. It's about context, it's about structure, it's about systemic issues. Mm -hmm. And so those are the kind of stuff that we, we need to consider. And I think the first call here would be to develop information about that first cohort. What do we need to ensure that they're not going to take eight years? That we flag and we identify risk factors early on so that takes us to the next thing, and that's the whole issue of student experiences. You know, you speak to any one of the students in the department, uh, and you ask, give our name to any one of them. They will tell you, we hate them. <laughs> we hate them. They're determined to give us all nervous breakdowns, <laughs> especially this time of the year. They pick on us. <laughs> so we have to think about the whole student experience and what it is that we can do differently. And so I would like to just reflect the, the social work community development dichotomy and relationship. During the time that I started working as a social worker, yeah, I know you're thinking it was when Noah left the Sea Scouts. <laughs> so 38 years is a long time. But community workers at that time were the people that went to prison. They were the people that worked alongside social workers, but they became the fall guys. Because as Dr. Hart says, that the engagement with issues, um, and I think there's a heavy reliance on following their gut, being able to read a situation, where we teach social workers to kind of follow approach, follow a model. And because of the nature of the work, um, the kind of, of student we're going to get, you need to take that into consideration. And so the whole issue of what is that curriculum going to look like? Are we going to kind of dole out the same kind of curriculum and get to public spaces like this and make speeches about decolonization? <laughs> but it's same old, same old. We cannot, we, we don't have the luxury to do that. So we've got to ensure that that curriculum speaks to the principles embodied in um, the kind of things that Dr. Cornell was talking about or Dr. Hart was talking about, that it reflects the, the pursuance of social justice, of anti-discriminatory practices, of inclusivity. So our curriculum must reflect that. And I think when we're looking at the issue of ethics. I teach an ethics course to the fourth year students in um, social work at UWC. I think despite the fact that I lay claim to teaching, my, my learning and teaching philosophy is an applied learning. Very few of the students get it right when you ask them to identify an ethical dilemma. So those are the kind of stuff that we need to look at. What skills are we going to give these graduates in terms of ethics? Not only um, ethicality, making ethical decisions, looking at 
the, the perils of duplicitous relationships. I mean, I know community <laughs> workers way back then. They would go to the local gang lord and have a few drinks with him in order to get by him to, to be able to do some work. If you do that in social, they'll kick you out of the country. So, so now we've got to kind of start interrogating those issues. And so it's not only about ethics and ethic principles, but it's also the notion of ethics of care. And that the ethics of care is rooted in transformation, transformative education, that it's rooted in what's contextual and appropriate for us. We can't kind of take old Sarah Banks stuff, who's written extensively, and ex expect our students to, to kind of make it their Bible. And so I think as a department, we have the privilege of having learned from everybody. So we don't have to repeat the same mistakes. Um, we'd be really dumb to do that. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. And I think the challenge that and the opportunity for cooperating. I've often said, you know, at UWC, there's always place at the table <laughs> for another person. And I think that's going to be more important to us now, that we work with yourselves, with other people, so that we can grow this emerging profession, um, development and profession, so that they're no longer in the shadow of other practitioners. Um, social workers could not do what they do without community workers, without folk like this, and my colleague there. Um, yes, we can you know, give leadership to the legislation that we have obligations with, but the other skills, and that's where this profession, and I think we owe it to them to, to aid their development and to aid the emerging as, as their own profession so that, you know, those unsung heroes, those people who've toiled in the community has an opportunity to make their contribution like they did before. Thank you, ladies and gents. Thank you very much, uh, Marcel, for that um, insight. <laughs> Uh, much appreciated, and then we shall hand over to Nikki to, to give her Thanks. input. Thanks. Pleased to be here. Um, community activism. Um, I was asked why. I think uh, it's my background from coming from student activism and fighting the apartheid, and I come from Pontyville. Uh, yeah. So um, for me, was you, when you see injustice, you, you step in. You, uh, for me, it's about speaking for the voice, for those who don't have a voice, as, um, as Ms. Lon said earlier, and, um, to work with people that you don't want, other people don't want to work with, because we, we tend to snub our noses, oh, no, no, that's not where we want to go. And everybody is special, <coughs> and, and working at the big issue, I work with adults that come from prison, that's homeless, that's foreign nationals, so <laughs> you don't, I don't look at the person, I don't look at who you are, but at the person who's inside. And I try and help from where do you want to go, what do you want to do, and enhance their wishes, and not putting what I want to do in them, but also giving them that voice of, you know, you are worthy, and getting people's dignity back, because our people has lost dignity. If we see our young people in the roads, who's on drugs, and, and, and the gateway of, of addiction is not alcohol or drugs, it's the broken homes, the abuse, there's no love, and our people are yearning for that. And 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 with and with, with doing community work, it's hard. Um, um, when Vieta asks me, who takes care of you when you do all these things? Sometimes you forget about you, but in the past years and doing this course also teaches you how you must take care of yourself and that you can't take care of others if you are damaged or sick and dealing with your demons as well because sometimes dealing with clients and with people triggers things that's in you as well and that's the, the, the good thing about dealing with self within this because that's what we learned I mean we did wellness and the depth of wellness and all that uh, you know and 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 I want to thank Cornerstone and, and, and Community Chess because I went to study because I couldn't afford 
to go study I, even now. And, and because I, I have access to resources, I went to look for things. I read things, community newspapers. I go online. And that's how I access this. And I'm participating in community chess programs that I had prior as well. And, and a lot of times, uh, uh, our community workers that works hard in our townships, in our communities, are not recognized mm -hmm. because they're not literate or they don't have education, but they have the heart. And being a luxury social worker, I deal with clients that come and complain about social workers that work in the government department, that don't do their jobs, that don't care, and, 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 and yet they have ethics that's in place, but, mm -hmm. but nobody's holding them accountable for what's happening and our community don't know the rights from A to Z or what they must do, or know that they can actually uh, uh, complain and report those people, but we don't know. And that's, I think, sometimes where I educate people and say, listen, this is your rights, but with your rights comes responsibility. And that's how you, and, and educating people, and, and with, and being a community, being a social, sorry, social worker and slash community worker, we're two combined, but it's also different in many ways as well. But for me, I'm blessed to sort of fuse both because I work in so many diverse sectors because I only don't work at the big issue. I work within my community. I work within my church. And I work with drug addicts in a recovery home. And I'm currently trying to work. I'm, I'm, I'm from Woodstock, so there's a place called the Plassey, which is an HR hideout. And I'm currently working in that community where I'm trying to work with young women to change their lives, but not preaching to them, but by being human with them and uh, uh, recognizing things within them, the qualities. I just came, before I came here, I actually came from there, and I met a young girl who's, who can sing beautifully, but, and you ask these young people, why are you on this path? And it's heartbreaking when people say, my stepfather, this, at home, this is happening, this is happening, and you, and you, and sometimes I wish I had lots of money where I can just buy a big land and just help people and just put them there and say, listen, we're going to make this work as us. And give them that power and, and, earn, and own ownership that they can change things within themselves because sometimes we forget and we, want pe we, we, we tell people you must go work, but people have inability to do things for themselves as well. You don't have to work for someone to be something or make money. You can be an entrepreneur and do your own, but skills development is also important. But it's, 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 it takes work and patience. And some of us don't, we just, it's a job, it's stats, it's you must fill the quota, and that's what government wants, and that's what we work for, and that's wrong. And our government must learn also to see that we're not working with things, we are working with human beings, we have feelings, we have emotion. And you can't just do things just because it must be done. And it takes time to work through those things. Development doesn't happen overnight. It takes time. For someone can take five years, someone can take two years. Where I've experienced where it took me almost four years to work with one person and encourage that person that he has the capability of changing his life. And only now it's coming through. He's becoming an entrepreneur. He's creating his own business slowly but surely. And, and these are things that makes me smile because for me, I don't earn a lot of money, but I need to survive. But still at the end of the day, you know, just to see someone happy and, and that smile and, 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 and with doing this course, there's so many obstacles that you do when you study, you're adult, you study, you've got your community work, you have assignments to do, you have all these things and then things happen, like as I said, life happens and then you think, oh my God, I have an assignment, it must be in by 12 o'clock now. And I don't have a laptop and I don't have a Wi-Fi at home. So you have all these things. But for me is, as I'm really grateful and I really appreciate it being given opportunity to study because I know what is education is power to a lot of things. And I tend to educate myself apart from studying as well. And, 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 and with, 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 as you said earlier on, with, with this whole professionalization, ethics is important. Because we have community workers in our community take advantage of so many things within their communities where abuse is happening, where donations come to them, they take it for themselves, or they sell it, or they make money, or whatever. And when, when things like this, people, it, it, this, nobody can just come and do as they please. This ethics is a, a standard you must uphold, norms and standards, 
and 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 I appreciate the fight for that, and 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 you know it, it makes your life worth that you can see these you can reap the benefits and teach people what they can say no to and yes to. This person can't do this kind of work within your community because they don't have qualifications and they don't have rights. Because people take advantage of certain things within our communities, and this is a really good thank you for the fight, Cornell. And 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 it's people like like this that we need behind us. You work in the ground, on the, in the grassroots. But sometimes people sit in their high towers; they don't have a clue what you deal with and what you go through with communities. These people, you can do the media; they will shout at you, or they will tell you, "No, we don't want this one here." Or this this dynamics involved. So you have to, you know, think and think on your feet how to work with things. But for me, I am personally, I'm grateful and. And and with being a really social worker and being in my community, I love people. I love what I do, and my gratification and thank you is a smile, and knowing I've changed one person's life, not for anything but for you, that person to change and grow and know that he's worthy and he's got his dignity back. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nikki. Uh, it's truly inspiring. Mm -hmm. um, There's a lot of passion yes. there. <laughs> Well, I've started in the beginning of the year on my journey with natural hair. So throughout the year, um, someone makes a comment and says, um, you have angel hair. So I looked at the person and I asked, um, what do you mean? So the person smiled and, and didn't say anything after that. But it made me think, um, there's also the perception that exists if you have natural hair that you are unorganized and that you are lazy. Um, I have had those comments and that experience before. And the same with um, NGOs. The perception is there that we are unorganized. And the perception is there that we have no idea what we are doing. And that we are just there because of the passion. And we are just there because of the love of it. But in actual fact, that is not true. And therefore, it is so um, good to know that... Um, that it's going to be professionalized, so so there can be structure, so that uh, that perception can change, so that people can look at us and know and see, but while well, these people are organized, and they know exactly why they exist. They exist with a purpose, for a purpose, and we need to acknowledge them. Um, so, yeah, in my experience um, within the field, um, there is a lot of things that we as NGOs are, we are missing the mark and we are just carrying on. There's so many NGOs that pops up and fly by nights and just um, they're just there and tomorrow they're not there and for so many different reasons. So I think it's, it's going to also help to sort of not only streamline but also manage that. So if there's a specific structure and a specific standard that we all need to uphold, um, that can also sort of manage that people can know that we can't just pop up and tomorrow be not there because we need to mean business. Um, yeah, um, I've uh, this year, look, I have a blue folder with me with a long speech, <laughs> but now I'm just talking of uh, whatever pops up. Um, um, as NGOs, we are also often um, missing the mark with regards to truly developing agency and uh, relating to the theme that we have, reclaiming agency. Um, we as NGOs often with the handouts and with whatever we do and the delivering of the services, we are creating um, or building and adding on to that dependency. And our clients and our, our beneficiaries, they are, are becoming dependent on us without us knowing. There was an interesting article that I've read and it is about um, Wheatley is a, a surname. Um, and she referred to a hero uh, uh, where politicians and NGOs often present themselves as a, as a hero. Um, and that is so true. So the NGO is then uh, perceived as the one with all the skills and the ability and is just up there, I want to help you. And then on the other side, um, we have the client that just wants to be saved. Um, and therefore, we then just carry on with that cycle of dependency. So um, the way that we are doing development, and hopefully with your professionalization, that will all push NGOs in that direction, where we would then really just realize that we need to intentionally do development. I get really passionate about this, people. Um, we don't really need to do development intentionally, and things can just 
happen accidentally. And we can't only be only driven by passion and for the love of things because we, at the end, people need to become their own hero. They need to become their own hero and become actively involved in their own development. And as my colleague said, it's going to be this, that's a process, but it's a process that we are willing to commit to. And I just, uh, to just rem uh, go back to the uh, perception that I've spoke about earlier, um, I've been in a, a year-long negotiation with a corporate uh, um, company there in, in, in the Swartland, just pretty much trying to convince him and understand that we as NGOs are, because of us, your workers can be productive. Because of us, your, you can have a profit. So just helping them to understand that we have a place and that we are contributing um, value in it. So um, that went well after a year. But that it, it the perception is there where they think that we are we don't know what we are doing and they don't have respect for our work so with this process it would really just add um, value to our work so there's that exploitation um, I'm hoping not only with this uh, professionalization would bring a structure and it would set a standard and uh, the ethics um, that we so desperately need. Because as NGOs, we often contradict our work through our practice. Because we say the one thing, we will do this, but at the end, we do the complete opposite. We'd also then make that people don't respect what we do. And then we want our work to be valued, but our practice contradicts that. So we do need that. But Within that space, we also need some form of protection, and I'm hoping it will come out, because um, there's a lot of exploitation that takes place with NGOs, because we are perceived as the cheap labor. Instead of government um, paying for expensive uh, services, service delivery, or expensive, sorry, not only government, private, corporate sectors, all the others, they would then use the NGOs to deliver that service for free, and in that, we often feel exploited and that unequal partnership that, that then exists. And um, so therefore I, I really like um, that there would be some protection. I would just wanna add off, and I'm going to the blue folder, just to read the last few because I can't remember it um, um, out, of, out of heart. I'm sorry, I'm there. Yes, professionalization of community development would, would add the following value to our practices as NPOs. It, provide, it will provide strategic di direction because of the specific policy. It will also create a platform for strategic thinking and leadership development. It will improve our confidence with regarding uh, when engaging with other sectors. It will improve effectiveness because of the standards in place. It will also increase our credibility of NPOs. It will reduce the number of fly-by-nights. It will also, um, the respect and acknowledgement of our work, but also the protection that we need against exploitation in unequal partnerships. I thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Hein Lies and all the other panelists. Now to the audience. Um, I'll go to this gentleman and then the gentleman at the back. I am from the Blue Downs area there, and, 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 and I was approached some time ago by an NGO. It's a, it's a woman, she was a nurse, and she um, her injured her back, and then her husband was um, um, a mechanic and the son and so on. And they were running an NGO. And they gave the impression that they care about the women sewing and doing so. And it turned out it was an employment agency for the family the husband and the wife and the son. And they were completely arrogant. It was their thing, it was their properties, what their ownership is, what everything and so on. So my point was, at the end of it, and they came to me, they said, April, we want you with your legal background, we want you to come in and so on and so on. And I asked them, I said, you know what? Is everything in order? And they said, yes, and said, what? What do you mean everything in order? And they wanted me to, to give them um, legal advice for free. And I said, I don't, I've got no problem. But then people came to me and said, they are very abusive. The, the, the husband, the son, has got no qualification. But he is an advisor. Advisor is one. That's number one. Number two, this, my second comment is this. 
most of the NGOs, there's a perception also that most of the NGOs, the people that it's an afterthought, it's a work, they couldn't get a work somewhere else, now they come and do this. And at the end of the day, nobody can tell them anything. So professionalization will help and so on. And the other comment is that at the end of the day is sometimes you do a job that the government should do. You take something that is very important out of the hands of the government and you allow the government to get away because most of the funding that used to come during apartheid to the NGOs here and they were doing a good job, those funds no longer come. Those funds end up with government. And then and the others in, 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 in the government, in government use that. And then the other NGOs, they struggle now and they must see how to get by. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the gentleman at the back. Um, before the gentleman goes, um, is anybody who would like to comment? Okay? Okay. Hi, I, I'd just like to make a few comments. Um, um, yeah, uh, community work is seen as um, the soft skill and the soft work and so on. And um, it is often assumed that um, it doesn't have meaning and it doesn't have uh, content and it doesn't have structure and it doesn't um, um, contribute because there is no evident, hardcore, concrete building that stands at the end of the process, like engineers when they built uh, Atlantis, when they built Mitchell's Plain, that the understanding was that they're building communities. They built concrete structures and they expect us to develop communities, that communities and, and good things will come out of these physical structures without the parallel building of communities and so on. And so one's uh, battle is often against the engineers, the planners, and all of those kinds of people at one particular level who um, would um, argue against you as to why do you need a social space? Why do you need social infrastructure within this whole development? Why do you need people's participation when you're building a big project and so on and so on? So that's one of the, since the 80s, that's one of the, when the state had these big projects, that's one of the key kind of problems that one had. On the other hand, nowadays, one have a lot of rebel rousers who, when there's an issue in the SWART line, and you've got your fair share of people in the farming community, who represent communities, especially when farm workers' rights are affected, and jump semi class and up and say, Ek is the hero van die gemeenskap, and so on and so on. Gee 20 grand in my account, and so on and so on. And um, dan gaan ons die probleem oplos, en ons gaan sommer die boer nou hoof toe vat, en ons gaan vir hulle gelijk sort of uitsot. That kind of rebel rousing kind of thing, without development, without social cohesion, without infrastructure, without a developmental process that takes place beyond that of organizing that farm community and making them being able to um, deal with their rights in a, con in a cohesive way and so on. So one often sees that. So when Dr. Lionel Lowe taught us the issue of the Reno and all the various elements of activism, of being the, uh, the uh, um, the legal kind of personality, uh, being the organizer, being the supporter, being all of those elements. Uh, uh, for me, when I, when I hear what you're saying, when students come and register, I ask a question, what is it? So my question to you is, what is their commitment on the day or when they register and they attend uh, the social work department? What are they coming to do there? So for me, that would be the first question. What, what is your commitment? And Hammer them on what is their commitment. If they don't have commitment, it's not a noga class that they can buy for to earn salaries to earn. They can computer science on a place and do it in an office and people can call and say, we want to sell another cell phone. That's, they can go and do that. But if they don't have the commitment to, to work and if they already don't have a, a commitment and understanding of volunteerism, then it doesn't help them to come to a social work department because they don't understand the basic principles of what it is that they are doing there. So for me, there must be that basic commitment and so on and so on. Social workers place their lives at risk. They go into communities who are already at risk. And nowadays, in nowadays, at the beginning, we dealt with Dacha and Mandrax and other kinds of drugs. Now you're dealing with Tukken and so on and so on. In the Swartland, in Citrus Dal, there are now 
many, many drug dealers who've taken over that community, rural communities, and the social workers cry there because their lives are threatened and so on. And there's nothing or very little they can do against these very strong opponents of social cohesion and development. So those are some of the elements, but for me it would be, what's the commitment of the student? What's the risk that they're prepared to take? What is their developmental perspective on being there and, and interacting with the profession? Okay, thank you very much. Um, the Leo, sorry, I have, have, have to observe protocol. The lady indicated that she, <laughs> um, yes please. Um, thank you. Um, my name's Jackie. Um, I have a couple of observations. Um, I'm a community activist, a volunteer, full time. Yeah, because so my observation, and I'm glad that you have it. Um, I have a couple of concerns uh, because I'm an activist. Um, Nick and I go way back. Um, so uh, the formalization of of being an activist changes the dynamic of an organization and a community. Um, Last year, I was at the Reclaim Agency, and one particular evening, um, the talks was on NGOs, NPOs, CBOs, and the amount of registered NGOs that exist in South Africa today. Um, it's quite alarming. Based on that, um, subsequently, um, my experience has been um, that you have professionals in some of these NGOs or these organizations, and some of them seems to have been started with the sole purpose of at times undermining the very community that they proclaim to work for, because they are funded by big business. Um, and big business, who's the donor, drives that particular NGO and their agenda. Um, so, so my comment and observation is how, in essence, will this particular um, legislation and that direct that kind of uh, input because it's actually more destructive than anything else um, because it leaves a community with a distrust for NGOs because quite honestly that's where I'm at um, because I've seen how destructive it can be. Thank All right, you. thank you very much. <clears throat> okay, Leo. Okay, um, yes, uh, my name is Leo. Um, I've had the privilege of uh, piloting the community development a program here at Cornerstone. I'm one of the lecturers, um, but also um, I've done uh, quite you know interesting research on uh, caregivers who are working with older patients in hospices, old age homes, and and so forth. And um, so part of the research project was to um, make a case, you know, um, for you know the professionalization of of of, of caregiving, right? Uh, so I'm actually thinking back now that I should have met you, you know, the the, the, uh, um, the time I was doing my field work, um, because you seem to have more, you know, uh, sort of intimate knowledge about what's happening in government, uh, particularly the Department of Social Development. I had the privilege to uh, um, uh, to interview the then uh, Deputy Director General here at Parliament, um, but it wasn't that informative. So sitting here, um, you, know, you know, following your, your, um, um, your discussion about the policy, and what has been implemented so far has been very, you know, uh, informative. Um, so basically, community practitioners are, are not the only people, um, or rather, you know, um, um, uh, professionals who are who have not been, you know, recognised. Um, we have had this case. Um, we have this case with caregivers. We had this case with uh, um, community health um, um, workers. Uh, I think Sank is now registering them, right? Um, and yeah, so there are many other low skill professions which have been seen as low skill, and and there's no need to you know to professionalize to train them. Um, and you know people always have this view that you know um, once you professionalize, you know it's it's sort of you know uh, um, it's um, it, it's sort of an affront to the voluntary ethos and as well as you know the the selflessness that you know that is the hallmark of such professions. So um, so that argument um, still stands. I mean. Because a lot of people are making a case against you know, the professionalizing. Because one of the points that they put forward is that once you provide, you know, uh, um, you know, qualifications, once you provide, you know, you know, the professional qualifications, and there's an expectation that you know this becomes, you know, a fair paying job, right? And um, and given, you know, the South African economic context, right? 
um, and you know, resources are very, you know, uh, um, um, I mean, we don't have enough resources, right? So when we, we and, and this is going to be the case, I mean, um, community development is going to be a professional occupation, right? Um, but now we need to think about how, how this will pan out in the future, right? Especially the expectation that we, you know, people now have qualifications and they need to be, uh, you, know, you know, to be remunerated, you know, uh, commensurate with their skills. And so, uh, secondly, uh, I just wanted to know, uh, since, you know, there's been a lot of uh, movement towards prof uh, professionalization, um, um, has there been any discussion uh, in terms of, you know, uh, creating sort of, uh, a, you know, creating career uh, pathways? Because many professions are dead end in the sense that, you know, you just become, for example, a, a community, uh, you know, practitioner, and then what, right? So people, you know, yearn for career growth, okay. right? So I just want you to sort of, you know, uh, 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 right. indulge me with the details in terms of how, 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 how this is, you know, uh, uh, you know being uh, structured. Thank you, Leo. Um, before we take any more comments or questions, um, can I ask the panelists to respond to some of the issues that were raised? Um, and I've just jotted down a, a couple. Um, you know, I think one of the key issues that 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 some of you have addressed as well, uh, Marcel, you spoke about you know students dropping out, um, and the gentleman asked, you know, so how do you how do you address that? I think the, the good shift that's happened is that social work um, as a qualification, or it's not the only way to get into university. If you failed at everything else, and do my social work. So, so that has changed, okay? Because admission requires, requirements are different. And so we have to keep the balance that we don't mimic what happened during the apartheid um, here's where we exclude people. Everybody has the right if they qualify. It's our responsibility to ensure that the curriculum, that the student grad um, attributes are what's going to make a difference to social work. And so those people who are coming in thinking that, you know, I'm going to get my degree and make lots of money, after they go into the field the second year, they're screaming and running around. They want to get out of the profession. So I think from the university's point of view, we are applying our minds and doing everything possible to ensure that we graduate the people who's going to make a, a contribution. And there's always going to be those folk who are exploitative, who is not going to do um, due diligence. Um, but that's our commitment. And I think the taking eight years, it's across the university. It's not specific to social work. In fact, the Department of Social Work at UWC is doing pretty well with that. <laughs> you might want to know. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Marcel. Um, uh, I think it's you that raised the issue around um, NGOs. And I wrote down here, how will legislation direct rogue NGOs? So that is a question to you, <laughs> Cornell, with, with this whole professionalization process. Yes, and I think it relates to one of the other comments also of what is happening when we're in communities with people. And I think a lot of it relates to people losing their jobs, um, low employment and employability. And so people start a business. And this is the bad part. I'll never forget my, my niece when she was in kindergarten. She had to go and talk about what does a godmother do. Hmm. Well, I had lots of people phoning me at that stage. I was working all over Africa. And so when she was asked what does her godmother do, she says she makes money out of the poor. But it was, it was such a grounding factor for me when my sister phoned me and said, you know what Eloise said today? And when the kindergarten teacher asked my sister, she didn't help because she said to my sister, so what is it really that your sister does? And she says, nobody is really sure. <laughs> and this was in, you know, 2000, 2001. But I think what has happened is that we tend to make business out of poverty. And so it comes back to this ethics issue. 
There's two things that has ground me, and it still grounds me to this day. As Gandhi also said, if you really want to see change, you must be prepared to die for it. Not to live a good life out of it. And the second thing that I think that we also need to keep in mind is that when we are community development practitioners, we are change agents. So we're a catalyst. We spoke a lot about that. And Nikki has raised the issue of, you know, you must get your own suitcase sorted because you can't get your own issues on the table because it's not about you as a practitioner. But I think what has happened, partly because of poverty and lack of employment and opportunity, People start with the best intentions. And we discussed last of last week how a lot of things we do as practitioners is subconscious. We do wrong things, but it's unintentional. But it's because of the context where we come from. What I would love to see with NGOs and the CBOs and the NPOs is that if every community development practitioner does his or her job properly, then NGOs will govern development. And I've often said this to students also in community meetings where people say, but the government. Then I say, no, we the government. Because we're in a democracy. But we're still grappling with our history where we were told no government will provide government. Government provided us a square box and they kept us there and they controlled how that box operates. And so we need to bring a mind shift in practitioners to say, you must start today to work yourself out of a job. And so if we don't empower communities as development practitioners, which is, this is where the professionalization will help. You know, you know communities can tell you off quicker. They can sort you. And so if they tell you off, it's because sometimes how they feel. Now imagine people that's free to tell you off are now empowered with their rights to say to you, you, Anna, as a practitioner, are not following your book. This is what you're supposed to come and do for us. And so then I think NGOs will come to the fore how they work in other countries, more affluent countries. Because NGOs are supposed to be by the people, for the people. And the money should be channeled through them. But at the moment, it's a risk. Often people highlight this with, you know, the days of the NGO coalition, etc. I was part of that when I was at IDT. But if we today start giving money too quickly for NGOs and for, for MPOs even, then we run the risk because of the people that's in charge that are the do-gooders intentionally or unintentionally self-enriching themselves out of it. And so if we start empowering communities to say no, a community organization is a vehicle through which we get organized, not a vehicle through which we get told what to do, a vehicle through which we get organized because government and corporate, they can't communicate with us as a community of 30 or 35,000 people. So they need an organization or a structure. So one of the things that we've done in, in all three levels of the qualifications is a theme or in the degree modules that focuses on organizational development, where that practitioner is trained on how to set up an organization with the community to run on their own and then I disappear as a practitioner. But that's not gonna happen now. We're only training them now. And so I think Activists like yourself, it's very important that you're part of this process so that you start being that change agent now already, so that we can get people to realize it's not business as usual, and to make money out of development, you're in the wrong profession. It's about servant leadership, and it's about giving so that you are no longer needed. And so you must give everything you have. And the funny thing is, the more you give to people, the more they actually enrich you. But it's that, that mindset. So I think if we look a bit on that, there is a lot in the norms and standards policy about that. And so those of you who like these policy documents, they are available, send the email and we'll share them. I see Berenice is here, so she's also, she can, part of this outreach that government is gonna do in the Western Cape this month. 
they will make those documents available too. On the issue of um, caregivers, next week, Thursday, Friday, th Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, we're finishing the new bill for Parliament on social service practitioners. And so I've mentioned the first three would be you know, child and youth who has a board, social work who has a board, community development that will have a board next year. But two of the other up and coming occupations is caregivers and early childhood development, ECD. There's a battle, we can't call it the battle of the sexes, but there's a battle of the occupations at the moment where ECD is not sure should they register under social service practitioner or education. And so there's that process. But we're writing the bill of such where we say these are the three professional occupations and other similar occupations in the service provision for society. So even though we know ECD and caregivers and healthcare workers are busy organizing themselves, we don't know in a year or two's time if there won't be another sector. There's two things that I love about the process in South Africa, and that is that we need it to organize ourselves for this recognition, yes, for the protection, but most importantly, for the protection of our communities and of society. And so it could not have come at a better time. And so there's a, there's a global trend at the moment where everybody professionalizes everything. Luckily, in South Africa, we legislate everything, yeah? don't you? It's like we legislate stuff that, I mean, there's policies that I don't even know of, but as long as the policy is there, whether it's implementable or not, another thing that CDPs must do with communities, because in a democracy, the people write the policy, but we don't even know ourselves how to write a policy, but then we take it to the people to say, buy in, buy in, buy in buy into the policy, have a meal, sign here, support the policy. It's not how it should be. On the career path issue, we're working closely together with Uma Lucy. Well, so there's the quality councils yeah, for training. So there's Uma Lucy, that's the school guys. Then there's the college guys with QCTO, uh, Quality Council for Trade and Occupations, who, by the way, in professional occupations, run with the professional body right up to level 10. And then there is the South African Qualifications Authority. And so five weeks ago, I was at the Sakwa 21-year celebration of what they call the NQF. See, now, now we go, it's late, so we must you know, get you into bad terminology now. But it's the National Qualifications Framework. And the big thing there is a career path means migration and articulation. Yeah. How do I articulate? How do I career path? And I can career path right up or I can career path horizontally. One of the good things is the way we're doing the social service practitioners articulation career path now is that there's going to be a big drive to educate society and up and coming youth as to in the social service practitioner's career path, this is not dentistry, it's not engineering, it's not medicine, so please don't think that with career pathing comes certain standards for salary. So people will learn that a professional title is not going to give me a certain salary, specifically because the country can't afford it, or if you don't like it, go study medicine, or like you've said, go study IT, or go study, you know. But this is the one part where a lot of social work professionals, registered social workers, earn at NGOs smaller salaries than confused sociologists like myself. Yeah? A three-year graduate, a fresh graduate, that graduates this year with a sociology degree, can earn almost 7,000 rand more than a four-year professional social worker. And so I think it's our obligation to educate young people. on it. The career path will be part of that. And so there's going to be, there's now a pilot with SAKWA to show all the different articulations and how I go from what we call a, a, a community development worker. Now, this is also interesting. Certain government departments say a community development worker is somebody with a three-year degree. 
Once we be professionalized, a CDW will actually mean somebody at a level four. So somebody that's just sort of less than a senior certificate. Then there will be an assistant CDP, a CDP, which is somebody with the level five. And then there will be a CDP, which will be the person level eight, nine, and 10. But then there's the people with level three, two, one, and zero. And so part of professionalization, because we follow an inclusive process, is continuous professional development. So once there's a professional body and I'm registered, it says to keep your registration, you must attend training or at least dialogues even like this. So think about that because that's also going to help where community volunteers can come and say, look, it's not about I don't want the qualification, I don't, I'm just a volunteer. But they will also have the opportunity to upskill or to be part of dialogue and be part of the process. So we can leave it at that because otherwise I'll keep you here until next Friday when we're going to go do the policy. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you very much. Um, in the interest of time, and I think I've been wrapped over the knuckles for allowing people to just go on and on and on, which is exciting because it's, it's exciting times for community development and professionalization thereof. Um, so I would like to take this opportunity uh, to say thank you to our panelists. Um, and if you have any further questions, um, find them somewhere in, th in the corridors of UWC, or the corridors here of, of um, Cornerstone, and have a conversation. Um, so thank you so much. It's extremely valuable and extremely interesting. And I'm looking forward to the, the next chapter. Thank you again to the panelists. Um, if you can just pass these little tokens of appreciation down. But I just also want to note that we have phenomenal women on this panel. They are making a difference in our communities. And you know, when we say communities, we're saying it in a very general way, but we know these are our marginalized communities. These are the people who need these interventions the most. So I just wanna say thank you so much for your time this afternoon. And then also to acknowledge and just for you to spread the word that these two students, the one is on our, Nick is on our highest certificate program in community development, and Heinelise is on our honors program in community development, and they both have bursaries from Community Chest. And next year, there's 50 bursaries for the highest certificate and 15 for the honors program that are available. So please do spread the word, go to the Cornerstone website, and let's all become part of this movement to professionalize the sector. Thank you so much. Yes, in two years, in two years, part time. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much. Okay. And thank you. You did so well. No, 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 no.